All three of these are singers and dancers who performed in the summer replacement TV show, Dean Martin Presents the Gold Diggers, and volunteering to entertain the troops in Vietnam with the Bob Hope USO show in 1969 and 1970. Many of you have met them during the week, and we are pleased tonight to present them with the President Award for supporting the troops in Vietnam. Our first recipient grew up in Akron, Ohio, singing and dancing. By the time she was 15, she was working summer stock. She, she moved to New York City at 17 in 1968. She saw an announcement for an audition for women 18 to 21 who were beautiful and could sing and dance. It was her first audition, and she was hired on to become a gold digger and flew to LA to join the group. She joined the Bob Hope 1969 tour to Vietnam and remained in the Gold Diggers and returned to Vietnam in 1970 with Bob Hope. She moved back to New York and performed in several Broadway shows before making her living for the next 20 years acting, singing, and dancing in TV commercials in New York and Los Angeles. Please welcome Paula Cinco. It's such a pleasure and an honor to be here with all of you. I can't even begin to tell you how much of an honor it is. We are so blessed to be able to go to Vietnam and perform for you, not only once, but twice. And the three of us that are here tonight were hired together, and we got to go to Vietnam together, and we've remained friends. So. If, if it's okay with you, I'd like to sing you a little song. And if you feel like singing along, please do. Let there be peace on earth, and let it begin with me. Let there be peace on earth, the peace that was meant to be with God as our Father, brothers all are we. Let there be peace on earth and let God bless you. Thank you all so much. Thank you. So our next recipient, who also went to Vietnam with Bob Hope in 1969 and 70, grew up in Stamford, Connecticut. She started singing and dancing as a child. As a teenager, her ambition was to be a member of the famed Rockettes at Radio City Music Hall in New York. During her senior year in high school, she decided to audition for the Gold Diggers and was one of three young women chosen to join. Three weeks later, in January 1969, at age 18, she joined the group in Los Angeles and spent five years as a Gold Digger. After retiring, she came back to Connecticut where she owned and operated a dance studio for 32 years. Please welcome Jackie Chidrasi. Did I get it? No. No. I'd like to say a few words and uh, share a story with you about my adventure in Vietnam, since you shared so many with me this week. When we were at some base, I can't remember, perhaps you can help me with this, it was almost showtime, and I decided that I better visit the facilities before the show began. So I was escorted to the latrine, which was situated directly in front of the audience, and why anybody ever put it there is beyond me. But nonetheless, there it was. So I entered, and I discovered that it was solidly enclosed from the ground to my shoulder. And from my shoulder to my head was screen, nothing but screening, like in a screen door. So that meant not only could I look outside, but the audience can, could look, and they certainly did look, inside because 
When my mission was accomplished and I stood up, I received a standing ovation. <laughs> So I'm back, all of these years later, to thank you for that ovation, to thank you for this wonderful award, and to most sincerely and heartfully thank you for your service. God bless. Our next recipient's father served in the U.S. Air Force for 23 years, and her mother was in the Women's Army Corps in World War II. She grew up in Virginia and Springfield, Mass, before moving to California when she was 13. She studied ballet, tap, and acrobatics, and as a teenager decided to be a dancer. Her first job came at age 18 when she performed in a six-month tour of Hello, Dolly! starring Ginger Rogers. She also auditioned for the Gold Diggers in New York in January of 1969, then went out to Los Angeles to do the Summer Dean Martin Show and joined the Bob Hope Tour at the end of the year. After two years as a gold digger, she left the group, appearing on Rowan and Martin's Laugh-In for one season, and then worked on other TV shows and in commercials before she left performing in favor of teaching dance. She began part-time teaching preschoolers, and in 1976, she formed Center Stage Dance Studio in Los Angeles, which she ran for many years. Please welcome Rosie Gitlin. Since I'm a dancer, I won't be singing. <laughs> so I just wanted to say to you all that the last few days being here in New Orleans and getting to speak to you, meet you, and talk to you about Vietnam has just been a fantastic experience for me. Um, it was a real privilege and honor for us, the Gold Diggers, to be invited by Bob Hope to go on his USO Christmas tours. And now every five years, the Gold Diggers get together for a reunion. And when we sit around and we talk about our careers and what we've done in our lives as Gold Diggers and afterwards, we all say the same thing. Going to Vietnam and entertaining the troops was our favorite thing that we did and our proudest achievement. And, um, and you know, we worked with some pretty incredible stars. We worked with Dean Martin and Frank Sinatra and Tony Bennett and John Wayne and Johnny Mathis and Lou Rawls. And, you know, I went on our website and checked them all out because as a senior citizen, my brain, I can't remember them all. But, you know, Anne Margaret and Raquel Welch. I mean, we, we worked with the best and the most famous, but entertaining you in Vietnam is what we loved the most. Um, one of you came up to us uh, a couple of days ago and said, I saw you in Camp Eagle. And then you said, and you, you're out there, you know who you are, you said, oh, Silent Night. Well, for those of you who didn't see the shows, Silent Night was how we closed the show. It was our final song, and we sang it all together, cast, crew, and you, the soldiers. And now, whenever any of us gold diggers get together and we hear Silent Night, we get choked up. We still are affected by that song and remember singing it with you. Um, <clears throat> you were very important to us then, and you are very important to us now, which is why whenever you invite us to one of your conventions, we happily come. So thank you for the invitation. And thank you for this award. It's not necessary. You didn't have to say thank you. You did it then, and it's much appreciated now. Thank you. Now we come to the VV Excellent in the Arts Award. The first grew up in Michigan and joined the Army, volunteering for Special Forces. He served two tours as a Green Beret medic in the Central Highlands in the Vietnam War, receiving the Soldier's Medal, the Vietnamese Cross of Gallantry, and the Bronze Star. He made a name for himself with his best-selling memoir, Grizzly Years, In Search of the American Wilderness, which came out in 1996 and is still in print. Grizz Grizzly Years, the Los Angeles Times said, is particularly compelling because it is not the simple story of a man rediscovering serenity amid, amid nature. 
In fact, he seems to spend most of his time seeking out grizzlies because they are the one truly threatening creature in the forest. As with other rebels from T.E. Lawrence to Hunter S. Thompson, he lives on the edge of death because doing so sharpens his dimensions of life. He's written four other books, including a war memoir, Walking It Off, A Veteran's Chronicle of War and Wilderness. A former Guggenheim fellow, he was the subject of a feature film about grizzly bears in the Vietnam War, and he has appeared on many TV shows, including The Today Show, Good Morning America, and NBC Evening News. A close friend of the writer Edward Abbey, a leading voice in the Western environmental movement, he calls himself a renegade a naturalist and grizzly bear biologist and lectures regularly about the wilderness and veterans' issues. He is chair of the board of directors of Round River, which works in Africa and North and South America on environmental and co conservation issues. Vietnam Veterans of America is proud to present the 2017 Excellence in the Arts Award to Doug Peacock. Thanks, guys. I appreciate that. I was in Vietnam all of 67 and through the Tet Offensive of 68. I was a medic in I Corps up in the highlands working with Ray Mountain Yards mostly. I was on two A teams and a mobile guerrilla team. And I got to a lot of parts of Vietnam. There were remote places before the war did. And God, it was a beautiful place. I loved the country. I loved the animals. I loved the people. I spoke enough Vietnamese to get by without a translator. On patrols. And uh, Vietnam was, you know, the, the crucible that really forged my determination to live the rest of my life. And it was propelled right after Vietnam because when I came back from Vietnam, I was, uh, I was just too crazy to be around people, you know, like thousands of others. Uh, none of us knew about one another, but we were nonetheless on the edge out there. So I went to the one place where I was comfortable, and I've been comfortable all my life in wilderness places. You know, I grew up in Michigan. My dad was a Boy Scout organizer, and I lived in the woods. And so when I came back in Vietnam, I bought a Jeep, and I camped out um, in the wilderness of the Rocky Mountains. And it moved north, um, camping out in 1968 until I got a malaria attack up in the Wyoming Wind River Range. And I went to Yellowstone Park, where I decided I'd soak in hot springs and recover from the malaria. And one day I'm soaking in this little hot springs, and I look off to the side. There's a mother grizzly bear and two grizzly bear yearling cubs. Now, I didn't know zod about grizzly bears there, except you won't, weren't supposed to get too close to mothers with cubs, because, you know, that's an animal that can kill you and eat you any time it wants to, even though it tends not to, but it could. And so... I'm soaking in this little hot springs, and it's a, a hot creek, and there's water pouring over my, my neck, and the bear's out there. And when they're not looking, I decide I'm going to climb a tree. So I stand up out of this hot springs, and the hot water effect, the whirlpool-like effect, causes me to black out. And, but I'm terrified, and I, and, and I reach for this tree, and I smash my forehead on this tree, cut a huge gash in my forehead, the blood is streaming down, but I'm so scared, I climb this tree anyway. And when I get to the top of it, I discover it's not much higher than a Christmas tree, you know? <laughs> anyway, that mother bear and her two grizzlies ignored me for 45 minutes in an October wind while I sat up there blue, naked, freezing, like some species of silly robin or bluebird in the top of this damn tree. And uh, those bears got my attention. And... You know, what I discovered was that's exactly what I needed in those days. I needed something more powerful and dominant than myself to get me out of myself. The last thing I needed was self-indulgence. To, to, I needed to get out in order to see back in. And when you're in grizzly country, that happens. It's kind of instant humility, you know. It's a, one animal out there that commands your attention. And uh, so that went on. I went on, and uh, I, I, I spent, you know, the next 14 years in grizzly country, eventually filming them with 16-millimeter movie cameras to ca capture a last document. The bears themselves in a place like Wyoming and Montana were in trouble during that time. And as I wrote in my first book, l much later, 
I, I said, these bears saved my life. Well, that's, that was the truth. And they were having troubles of their own, and it was simply payback time, you know, another notion from Vietnam. And so I spent the next, actually it's still going on, you know, I, I protect grizzly bears and the places they live, their habitats, they mainly live in really wild places. <clears throat> and that has become my mission. And, you know, it, it, I didn't have to look for it, it just slapped me in the face. I mean, I wasn't looking for bears, but they were out there. In the middle of that time, I ran into Edward Abbey, a wonderful writer that uh, he's gone now. I actually I buried him in a beautiful, illegal grave deep in the desert, according to his last wishes. That's something friends can do for one another, you know. But, uh, you know, the um, Vietnam was the door that opened to that friendship. And 25 years ago, I co-founded a group called Round River Conservation Studies. I'm still nominally involved. I mean, I'm the chairman of the board of directors, but I don't do the day-by-day -day stuff. But what we do is we work with indigenous people all over the world to create homelands that are largely wilderness. You know, they're, they're, we work in, in North America, they're native people, they're, they're, uh, they're Indians. And uh, in British Columbia, we've working with the uh, Helsuk and the Taka River Tlingit, we've saved about 20 million acres of wilderness. Now, that's a lot. You know, Yellowstone Park is a little over 2 million, so that's like 18 or 20 Yellowstone Park. And since that time, we've worked, we started working, we were the first group that asked the native peoples about bear's ears. In, in 2012, Round River, we hired Mark Maryboy, my Navajo friend, to interview all the elders down there. That's, you know, other groups had campaigned for wilderness in southern U Utah before, but no one ever asked the Indians what they wanted. Well, we did. And, uh, and we're up to 30 some million acres, which is the most wilderness from an organization that doesn't blow its own horn since Jimmy Carter. Carter. And I'm, I'm proud of that. Right now we're working up in the, uh, up <coughs> in the Yukon, on the north slope of the U Yukon, adjacent to Alaska on the Beaufort Sea with the Inuit people. And again, you know, the work is to create a national park of six million acres based on caribou calving and stuff like that. But, you know, what's happening up there, it's, it's amazing. It's heating up twice as fast as the rest of the world. And the polar bears, there's no sea ice left on the continental shelf. That means there's no marine mammals, no seals for the polar bears to hunt. And so they're going inland south. They're eating caribou calves and snow geese, but they're running into grizzly bears who are coming north and they're interbreeding. The offspring of polar bears and grizzly bears are, are reproductive. You know, they can have cubs of their own. But what it does is it just, you know, if you want to think about climate, it, it's unbelievable up there and it's affecting everybody's life. Um, and the last decade especially, but a little before then, I've been working with veterans and uh, most of the veterans I work with are, are younger than us, you know, they're a little more spry and they drag your butt out and walk your tail off, get into the tops of mountains. You know, they're Afghani and, and Iraqi veterans. But uh, we do wilderness programs and, you know, the notion is kind of go out in the, the, the wilderness and kind of let it happen to you. You know, whether it's fly fishing or climbing a peak or just going out and, you know, immersing in wild nature. Everybody agrees that it's, it's a timeless healing experience. And so I fight for the habitat that supports that kind of healing, which is wild habitat, grizzly bears live on it. And my rationale is odd, but this is what I think is, you know, we humans, we evolved not in cities or farms, we evolved as hunting and gathering people in these wild habitats whose remnants today we call the wilderness. And uh, it's just my hunch that our children and grandchildren are going to be needing places like that. And I'm going to do everything I can for the rest of my life to, to fight for such causes. And uh, that, um, that obstiny, even militancy, it grows directly out of Vietnam. I wouldn't trade my experience in Vietnam for everything. 
Thank you so much for this award. Thank you, guys. You bet. Our next Arts Award recipient is an internationally acclaimed actor who grew up on the Cherokee Nation in Oklahoma and spoke only Cherokee until he was five years old. Read that. He joined the National Guard at age 17, went on active reserve status, and then volunteered to serve in Vietnam. He put in a tour of duty with Alpha Company of the 3rd Battalion of the 39th Infantry Regiment in the 9th Infantry Division, in and around Saigon in the bush and with the Navy Riverine Operations. After coming home, he went to college, became involved with the American Indian Movement, then returned to college in Tulsa where he started taking part in acting workshops. He then moved to Los Angeles and started getting work in film. He was cast in Pow Wow Highway in 1989, one of the first movies to take an honest look at the lives of contemporary Indians. The next year, he landed a part in the Kevin Costner film, Dances with Wolves. His performance as a Huron with an abiding hatred for the British in 1992's Last of the Mohican was his breakout role. Since then, he's appeared in many films and television shows, including Geronimo, An American Legend, Avatar, Comanche Moon, and Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee during his 35-year career. And those and other parts, he broke new ground, bringing fully developed Native American characters to the screen and highlighting the success of Native Americans in non-traditional roles. In addition to acting, he's a stone carver and musician and has written children's books. And in 2013, he was inducted into the National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum's Hall of Great Western Performers. Vietnam Veterans of America proudly presents the excellent and the awards awards to Wes Sudi. Everybody loves somebody sometimes. <laughs> yeah, so now you know I can't sing. I don't dance. But I like to scare people. I've been told over the past few days that I have done so in my past, in my career. And uh, I thank you for being scared. Alpha Company, 3rd of the 39th Infantry, 9th Division. Anybody out there? Sixty-seven. I love reunions where I meet somebody that I used to know. <laughs> but, <laughs> and I had come here hoping to do that, but uh, I, I suppose it's uh, just not meant to be. So there it is, but at least somebody from the 9th Division is here. And I, I want to join you all in saying welcome back. Some words that uh, weren't made available I think for a lot of us back at the time when we could have really used them. <laughs> Welcome home. <laughs> Wonderful. As was mentioned, I, uh, I was having a, a conversation earlier with uh, one of the officers of uh, v Vietnam Veterans of America, and um, the subject came up of, well, um, women in combat. Do they really want to be in combat? And, and so I had to find out for myself, uh, what do you think of it? Women, do, do they really want to be in combat when, when they don't really have to? Uh, and so it reminded me, actually, I was told that, yes, well, there are women athletes, there are women, uh, women that do anything and everything that men do. That's, and that's a wonderful thing. It's, uh, but, and if they want to, they can go to combat if they'd like. I wondered at that time, I, I wondered to myself, why would they want to if they don't have to? But I'm from the year, I'm from back in the years when there was a draft, you know? 
when uh, we all wanted to maybe get out of it or maybe not get out of it. Now, in, but, and I also answered my own question in that the reason I went to Vietnam was much more personal than it was anything else in that I was um, reactivated as a National Guard person um, and uh, I went to a company in Fort Benning, Georgia, which uh, was made up mainly of returnees from Vietnam. And they began to tell their stories. I'm hanging around there, tell, listening to these guys tell stories about what went on during their time in Vietnam. And some of it was sad. Some of it was in between. Some of it was happy. Some of it was good stories, stories of good times they had over there, and stories of loss, and of bravery, of, of uh, brotherhood, something that they could remember and cherish as have, having been part of something much larger than themselves. And it intrigued me. And I thought of the danger that they had faced over there, the, uh, the, the awful dangers that existed and were, that rained down upon them there. But it also made me ask the question of myself, what would I do in that situation? How would I handle that? Can I measure up to being in that kind of a situation, I had to know. I really wanted to know, so I volunteered. I had about a year left in my six-year obligation at the time, so it worked out well. Uh, I had just about a year to go, so I went and I found out what I wanted to know about myself. Wasn't it all good? Wasn't all bad? But as far as I was concerned, yeah, I measured up, I handled it, and I was very, very happy to be able to have been there and come home. But I must tell you, I think the time I was the most scared of any time at all during the whole year that I was there was that time where you walk out of the <coughs> buildings, out onto the tarmac, and onto the plane. Then you hold your breath, hoping nothing happens. <laughs> you got, you're, you're so short. You're so short, you can't, you know, you look up to see bottom. And you're thinking, oh my God. You know, only bad, bad karma could you know, take me out now. So, and, but in any case, that, that was it. And I like Doug, a very interesting young author there. I, I myself would not ever, ever give up having had the experiences I had in Vietnam and known the people that I met there. And one other thing that was I found very endearing about the country was <clears throat> was the people, the Chuhoys that we became friends with, and villagers whenever we stayed in a place here and there. They look at me and they and they kind of hmm, what is it? What is it about they they study me like and then finally same same written to me. You same same Vietnamese. Well, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm just about as dark as you. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm a little taller than most of you. <laughs> but like I said, we had good times too. We had Jimi Hendrix on the little stereo, and we had. Cream and we had da 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 da. Yeah, 
all of that. We had all of that in tiny little bunkers where we, we could have a good time. And I won't tell you what we smoked, but. <laughs> in any case, <laughs> we had a great, I think, I think I had a good time. I had a terrible time. I had an experience. And it's an experience I will never forget or nor regret. And I want to thank the Vietnam veterans of America for recognizing the fact that I was there. And what I have done since then, I dedicate, I dedicate to you. And hopefully uh, we'll meet some other place much calmer and without Agent Orange or any of that kind of stuff. So, but thank you in any case. Welcome home.